Ephesians chapter 1. This morning, Lord willing, we're going to focus on verse 3. And I want to start reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him." in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that as we come before you this morning, that you pour out your Spirit upon us, Lord, that the Word of God may firmly land in our hearts, that you will uncover and reveal new truth to us from your Word. Lord, that you will hide me behind the cross, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be found acceptable in thy sight. Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Lord, I pray that you will give me utterance to make known boldly the word of God that we have here before us this morning, that we may have a deeper understanding of this truth that the Spirit inspired Paul to write. We give thanks to you, Lord, for those who are not able to make it through the church doors this morning. Lord, if they're able to watch, I pray that you bless them this morning. For those who are ill and unable to be here, I pray that you heal them. Lord, for those who have gone astray, I pray that you herd them back to the fold. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the favorite times that I have as a parent is when I'm a when you're a parent and you come home and your kids have been gone at school all day and you walk through the door and something exciting has happened at school as soon as you walk through the door they just begin to ramble on like this continual huge one long run on sentence just about how excited they are about something Usually it's, Dad, do you realize how awesome Daniel Hunt is? And then it's this, 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 this. And it's this long diatribe, these sentences that keep unfolding. And I have to wait till they calm down or I coach them to a place of breathing before I can understand how excited they are and why they are just so excited. That's how I read this portion of text here. Every word that we just read this morning in the original Greek is one entire sentence. There is no stop here. There is no punctuation here. Paul is 
literally just unfolding objective upon objective, verb upon verb, as he continues to build about this grand excitement that he has in God. Praise be to God. That's literally how this opens up in verse 3. Many of the Old Testament uh, writers and people who study the Old Testament and the New Testament believe that in ancient literature, this section, verses 3 to 14, is the longest one on sentence ever recorded. Paul has made no mistake here. This text here that we see here when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's heart is starting off saying literally, praise God. When we get through the last portions of this 4 through 14, Paul begins to tell us just why he's praising God. But the excitement that he has just starts off saying, we need to praise God. Praise him and praise him now. This portion here is not like we see in the book of Romans. <laughs> Paul is not trying to build a theology, theological argument to help you understand the truths of God's word. This is, in some regard, the opposite. This 3 through 14 is a doxology. It is an offering of praise because of the theological understanding that Paul has about our God. You see, shallow theology results in shallow worship. Paul understands so much about God here that all he can do is offer up praise for God and how God worked. On Wednesday nights, we do something here to kind of help us understand what Paul has done here. On Wednesday nights, what do we do? We offer up prayer requests. And many times after we offer up prayer request, we then turn to hymn number 14 and we sing the doxology, which is this praise that we give to God for all the requests that he has answered for us on our behalf. It is that we arrive here and get a deeper understanding about just how good God is. We arrive here and get a deeper understanding of how God answers our prayers and the outpouring of this, the outfall of this, that, that here we are living at different places all throughout the city, and yet God not only heard your prayer, but he heard my prayer, and that he answered our prayers. This is an amazing thing. Ephesians is this doxology. Notice what he says here. This is not a praise for what God has done in the temporal, but what God has done before the foundations of the world. This is not a praise about what God is going to do in his life. This is a praise about what God has already done in his life. That's a very important thing for us to understand. He will even further highlight this in this same verse when he says, who hath blessed us in the past tense with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Paul is expressing thanks, possibly to the most forgotten person in the Trinity, God the Father. We often find ourselves in moments of praise when we Praise the Lord because he died on the cross for our sins. Just as I prayed before we begin to dive into this text, I prayed that he would pour the Spirit upon us. We prayed when we took up the offering that someone would see their desperate need of Christ and repent of their sins and be saved if there was someone here lost in the building. Yet it seems that oftentimes... God the Father is forgotten in our minds in how our great salvation came about. We pray that the Spirit would be upon us, but what of our praise to God? 
you understand that the reason that we sing the doxology that the, after we count our answer prayers is because we have this deeper understanding about a God who cares about our life. You may be thinking, why is this so important? Uh, because Paul's doxology is not an argument. It's this nonstop praise of the understanding of our great salvation. It means the more you know about God, the more you will want to praise him. Bad theology promotes poor worship, lack of worship. Certainly this morning we should all be testifying today that God is worthy of our praise. This is not Paul's notes from the mountaintop experience. This is not Paul's notes from this highlighted moment in his ministry. This is Paul's praise from, as we've already covered, the prison cell. Whether we acknowledge it or not, our behaviors in times of what we may consider discouraging moments in ministry are times when in our personal lives, when things are not going the way that we desire. In these moments, what we must understand that how we behave ourselves in these moments can be what spur people on to deeper commitment to Christ. I mean, this is why we read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, right? All of these people who stood, who gave their life for the cause of Christ, who made bold statements, who stood without fear and was willing to commit it all for the truth of this message. Is this not spur us on or challenge us even in our own lives? Paul says here from the prison three times, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath what? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Paul, how you doing? I am blessed. <laughs> well, Paul, what have you been the recipient of? I've been the recipient of a lot of blessings. Well, where are they at? Well, you can't see them because they are anchored in heavenly places where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. Uh, the treasure of Paul's life was not before man's eyes. It was safe and secure in heaven. So he uses this word, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where, in the Greek, this is where we get our word eulogy. It comes from the word eulogio. Paul is preparing to offer this eulogy of praise to God about all that he has done and for all that he is. I know some people say, I don't praise God for what he has, so to say, done in my life. I praise God for who he is. Well, good. But let you know this, if God hadn't done what he'd done in his life, you would never praise him for who he is. I praise God for not only who he is, but I praise him for what he's done in my life when making me realize just who he is. All that we have here, Paul is emphasizing that it is from God the Father. Our salvation is from God the Father. Whether we recognize it or not, that is where salvation begins, with God the Father. Then our salvation was purchased on Calvary's hill by God the Son and Jesus, Jesus Christ. And it was wrought in our lives through God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who made this alive, who quickened us in our lives. But recognize here, the praise that Paul is offered up is the beginning sources of our salvation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, praise God. This praise that Paul is offered up here is really this time of adoration. He is letting everyone know just how much he adores God. I wonder even in our own lives, did we 
wake up this morning with a time of adoration, thanking God for even developing a plan that would wrong about my own salvation. I wonder even in our own lives, have we even this past week had a time of adoration in our own lives? Do you have a adoration meaning like deep love? Do you have a deep respect for God this morning? Do you find yourself there praising God as you take in his manifold wisdom in your life? Do you find yourself praising God as you think about how all of this came before the foundations of the world and has come along some 6,000 years and has firmly landed in your heart and brought you at peace with God? Who but God? Now, we pray in the Spirit to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Christ is the mediator so that we can have access to God. His blood washed me. It paid the price. It purchased my redemption so that I would have this peace with God. It was God's plan to provide a plan that I would even find peace with him. I, I praise him for that. This salvation is and we will see later on in this verse the greatest gift that mankind could ever have. And for all of this, Paul offers in these verses all the way to verse 14 a continued state of praise. This is Paul's implication that God is continuously worthy of our praise. His life plays that out for us, does it not? I mean, when we look at Paul's life, do we not recognize that Paul firmly believes that God is worthy of his praise at all times? Paul, where are you at now? I'm in prison. And praise be to God. If you turn back to Acts chapter 16, what do we find in Acts chapter 16? Paul and Silas, as they entered into Philippi, wrongfully beaten, shamefully thrown in prison, and in the darkest hour of the night, they praised and worshiped God. This is a eye opener for us because we must realize that in this text of verse three, that this praise that is being offered to God is not tempered or tampered by temporal situations. It doesn't change the fact because he's in prison. None of this bothers them. As a matter of fact, I guess you would say this. When we think little of our salvation, when we think little of it, we will think little of God. Think little of what God has done for you, and you will certainly do little for him. But if you will just sit back and grasp and really take a hold of this great salvation, ponder it, dig in it, you will arrive at this natural state of praise because you realize even though it has been told to you, you cannot fully understand what happened on the day that God saved you. <laughs> it's beyond my reasoning at times. The depths of his love, the understanding of what it means. I found myself even baffled in this text, trying to wrap my mind around just how this all works when he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He became God in the flesh, and yet God the Father is God's God. Who can understand all these things but God? Paul says, praise be to God. Theology that does not change our lives is, can, well, theology that doesn't change our lives can be summarized as this. It's bad theology. This depth of what Paul sees, of what God has done in his life, has changed his life. So he says, again, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of who? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we just covered this on Wednesday night, in verse 2, he said, grace and peace 
be to you, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, why didn't you just say it like that? Why didn't you just say, blessed be our God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ? But that's not what he says here. Paul is trying to bring in an emphasis here for us to have a deeper understanding. Paul's emphasis is not that just, just is not just that God is our God, but that this salvation that He is also Jesus' God and that He is also Jesus' Father. Now, this at times can be confusing to us if we try to, I guess, completely wrap our minds all the way around it. But remember this, that in the Old Testament, what do we say? That he was the God of Israel, right? This was the Old Covenant. He was the God of Israel. He was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. But now he is the God of the New Covenant. This new relationship that we have in Christ. We have a new relationship through Christ. Just, just to be even further clearer, this is not a one-off text. Paul didn't slip up here by calling God, Jesus is God. Matter of fact, and when Jesus was talking to Mary in John chapter 20 and verse 17, after he had risen from the grave there in the garden, Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brother and say unto them, I ascended to my father and your father and to my God, and your God. There is this distinct separation here. Yet we see even in this text what the Lord is saying. What did he say in John chapter 20? He said, go and tell my brethren. Yet he recognizes when he says, go and tell my brethren that this new relationship that we have in Christ, in faith, in him, in his redemptive work has now made us share a father. Yet, he still distinctively divides your God and my God and your father and my father, yet it is the same God and father. Now, he also says in John 20, like I said, John 20, 17 about this brother. And but in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, what did he say? He said, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it is to say all of this, you could summarize it, that Christ became man. He was God in the flesh, yet he became flesh. He became a man so that he could know God as humanity knows God. Yet in the same breath, he still was God. Yet he came into humanity, and he was God the, Father, God the Son, but he also recognized God the Father. He did the will of his Father. Yet he also said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Yet he's still God. Yet he's still God the Son. Yet there is a unique relationship that, Christ has with God the Father. We recognize that. John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, the only begotten of the Son, of, or the only begotten of the Father. John chapter 3 and verse 16, we quote that all the time, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 says, He spared not what His own Son. Yet, yet, this is what has Paul so excited. Because he is acknowledging that there is a unique relationship that God the Father has with God the Son. Yet, through Christ and what he's done. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16 says, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. How is this going to be in one body? By the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So what does our text say for this? It is because of the relationship 
where Jesus is God, and yet God the Father is His God, and yet God the Father is His Father, and we have this relationship with Christ. God the Father has now become our Father, and yet we are yet His sons. But it is only through this relationship in Christ. You see, this is what's going to pour out all the way in to verse 14, as we read this morning, everything we have, yes, praise be to God, but it's only became available to us in Christ. That's it. With, without Christ, we would have no relationship with the Father. With, without Christ, we could never be His Son. It is like this in the courtroom that we are standing in the courtroom and Jesus Christ is our representative. And as we stand in the courtroom, God is the judge upon us. And as God is judging down upon us, Jesus Christ, our representative, steps forward and says, he's covered under the blood. And God says, he is covered under the blood. I'll adopt you. And God brings us from the courtroom into his family. That's what verse 4 will go on to tell us that we have this great adoption, but how did this come about? Through Christ. Without him, we have nothing. Without him, we can't even be adopted as sons. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you are not God's son. You can't cry that God, that God is your heavenly father. And this is where Paul is in this outpouring just for deepening our understanding, this relationship that we have in Christ, which was all a part of God's plan. If you was to go through verse, all the way to verse 14, I'll stop short, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where at? In Christ, according to as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. This was the method to bring us into relationship with God. This was the way in which we would be able to say, he too is our father. In the courtroom, we still stood guilty, yet Christ covered us in his blood. Blessed be God, the Father and uh, God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When my father died, I received a card in the mail. When I received this card in the mail, it was a love offering, and they said, please use this towards help bearing your father. I was thankful for that. The result of me being thankful for that caused me to, A, thank God, B, to reach out the sender who God used to be a blessing in my life. I set out to thank them for this gift that I had received. See, true thanksgiving, true thankfulness will always bring us to a state of thanksgiving to the one who sent the gift. Who hath, what is this? Who is this who? This is God. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. It is God. It is God who blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Paul seeks to draw our minds back to the source of how we are blessed with all these spiritual blessings. I praise God for this. Now, the intentions of this. Now, the question is, what is Paul's intention of even starting this off as he sends this to Ephesus? And the surrounding cities. This is would be considered a, a circular epistle, meaning that it was meant to be circulated around the other churches. So Paul writes this epistle, but what is the, the point of this? Paul's desire as he writes this, 
Blessed be God, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Eulogia, eulogio, eulogito. Every one of them is a state, a verb, a noun, a, an action in which praise is being offered up to God. Paul's desire is, and believes this to be true, which is, is absolutely factual. That when our theology brings us into a state of praise to God, it can spur others to go into a state of praise as they try to grasp a hold of the deep things of God that he has poured upon our lives. I praise God, Paul says. Paul in chains here writes to say, hey, everyone in Ephesus, I've only written to tell you I'm praising God. Matter of fact, it's even more than that. I'm writing to tell you that I proclaim that the source of all the blessings that I have in my life is from God the Father. I proclaim even further that he is the source of all spiritual blessings. He is the eulogio. If you was to separate this from the first one, when we see blessed be the God and Father, this is to say that this term for the word blessings or blessed um, here in this text, in this portion, who hath blessed us, this comes from the word eulogia, which means the person that they are speaking of is the one who has invoked or put prosperity upon. So when he says, who hath invoked prosperity upon, who hath blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's saying, listen, it's God who's blessed us. It is God who prospered us. And now certainly it is God who blesses us with physical blessings. Of course it is. All physical blessings we have are from God, without a doubt. That's not Paul's point. Paul goes on to say that not only has he blessed us with physical blessings, but he goes on to say that the blessings that he has in his life are spiritual blessings. They're spiritual. Notice also the tense of this. I said this earlier. When the person who sent me the card, I wanted to reach out to them and tell them thank you because of how they had blessed me. When he says, who hath blessed us, this is to say that in God's point of view, in eternity past, in the past tense, God has already poured out upon us all of our spiritual blessings. It's already been done. In God's mind, it is signed, sealed, and delivered. It, now, it may take time for the reality of those things that God has poured out upon us to become apparent to us, but in times past, God has already poured out all the blessings that Danny Holt needs in his life as he lives out his Christian journey. He said, whom hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. They were all given at one time, according to what the text says, who hath blessed us with all these spiritual blessings. All at once, God opened the vault and blessed us. Though the reality of this time will take, the reality of this will take time. Before the foundations of the world, the, found, the blessings were poured out upon us. But notice what it says here. Oftentimes, we'll make the argument, well, you know, hey, hold on now. This, some say that this is because um, salvation, before the foundation of the world, that God had planned this, ordained this. He had laid this out. Uh, this is not something specific to only salvation. He says all spiritual blessings, all of them, all of them were already done. Now, he also lays out for us here, this is in the supernatural realm. You can't take these blessings. By the way, 
Paul didn't say he hasn't been blessed in the physical, but he said the most important blessings that he had in his life are spiritual. These blessings that he has in his life that we have in our life that are in heavenly places, you can't take them to PNC Bank tomorrow and deposit them. Yet, they are the only blessings that Paul finds any reason to praise at all. Notice also he does not just say temporal here, um, but he says spiritual here. And as we said, you know, obviously um, God does bless us in the physical. But do you believe this morning that the greatest blessings that you have in your life today are spiritual blessings? Do we really step back and say the greatest blessing? I, I think we get confused sometimes. We try to merge the temporal into the spiritual and turn assets into blessings. God has blessed me with this car. Three years from now when the car is breaking down, we ain't talking about God blessed us anymore. You see, the blessings that Paul is bragging about, they never wear out. They never break down. They never lose value. They are secured in heavenly places. As we said, we, we don't have to worry about the blessings that God has given me to be robbed. <laughs> I don't have to worry about it. We may lose things in this life, but that which is of value is secured in heaven. My spiritual blessings that I have, they can't be plundered by the enemy. They'll never be stolen. You know, why is this so important to take in? Because it aligns our life's point of view. It aligns our life's point of view that our true treasure, all of it, all of it, is actually in heaven. If we will align in our minds and realign in our minds that the things that we have in this life, while God does bless us with physical things, that at the end of it all, if we lost it all, it's not even where the true treasure is. <laughs> and you know what? Paul says, even in this state of being chained to this Roman centurion 24 hours a day, I am thankful because though my physical body is in bondage, what is waiting for me is still waiting for me. <laughs> the outlook may be grim here, but my blessings are secure. Our, our, like I said, our car we once viewed as a blessing may be broke down now, but not in heaven. Blessings are blessings. Our blessings are eternally secure. They don't wear out. They don't go out of style. Praise God, they have been resting in a secure place, in heavenly places in Christ. Now, this phrase, in heavenly places, is used only five times in the New Testament, and every time it's used in the New Testament is in the book of Ephesians. In heavenly places. This is the sphere I guess you could say, in which our blessings rest. It, it was said that, that in the times of the 1930s, you know, I heard all about my grandma when she talked about what it was like living through the Great Depression. Oh, the hard times. Well, most of us have forgotten about the Great Depression and all of its hardships and woes because we're in a state of prosperity. Well, let's Things keep going like it's going, but who knows? But, um, but, you know, there was a story that was written about this lady. She was a timid lady, an older lady, and she um, had found herself um, where she couldn't pay this insurance policy anymore. So she took herself to the agent, and she just went to the agent to inform the agent that uh, she regretfully could not pay the premiums anymore. And when she reached into her purse and pulled out this um, policy, they said her hands were shaken as he gave it to the agent. And he explained to this elderly woman that this is not the time to cancel this premium. You've been paying it all of these years. And as they went back and forth, the agent said, ma'am, what does your husband have to say about canceling this policy that he's purchased for himself so that when he dies, you will be paid. She said, well, well, this is part of the problem why I've been struggling so hard. My husband's been dead for three years. Here this 
woman had been living in a state of affliction. Yet what took to give her prosperity in her life had already been purchased for her at the death of her husband. I think that oftentimes this is where we are in our own lives. We have failed to realize that the greatest life insurance policy of all times became due when Christ died on the cross. Through his death, we have these spiritual blessings, the spiritual treasure in heavenly places, secure, set aside for us through Christ's death. This policy has been paid when we repent of our sins and place our faith in him. This is what we have. Where do we see that at? Well, it says it right there in the end of verse 3, that we have all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where at? In Christ. It is in him that we have this great blessing. In his death, this blessing was secure. In breath. In his death, we have this great blessing, this great wealth given to us. You leave off his death, there is no hope for us. If you leave off Christ's death, then there's no remission of sins. If you leave off in Christ, we are still yet in sin. <laughs> yet in Christ, every spiritual thought you ever had was because you are in Christ. Every desire you've ever had to offer up praise and worship to God is because you were in Christ. That's it. We have been blessed beyond measure as we have been found in him. So what does Paul say in this text, in this doxology of praise as he offers up praise to God in this verse, in verse number three, Paul first takes the initial swipe to say, I praise God who is the God and who is the father of even our Lord Jesus Christ, who also is our God and father because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has poured out all blessings in times past and secured them in times past upon us. They're already done. They've already com been committed in God's mind. And how do we ever receive those things secured in heavenly places? Through Christ. But it was all God's divine plan in the fact of bringing about our salvation. Deep theology can only lead to one place, an outpouring of worship unto God for who he is and what he has done in our lives. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank you for even having the desire to be here. All of this is from you. All of the desires to come here and praise and worship is because of what you had before ordained in sending of your son. Lord, we pray that if there be someone in the building who's lost, Lord, that you make their condition aware to them that they are in desperate need of salvation. If this sounds foreign to someone's ears this, this morning, that they don't want to sit back and say, praise be to God. That they don't want to sit back and say, praise God for all that he's done. Praise God for this salvation. If this sounds foreign to them, Lord, let them search their own hearts to see that there may be something wrong with them. We praise you, Lord, for all that you've done. We give thanks. We pray that you'll be with us as we continue this study in Ephesians, Lord. That you'll open our eyes to the truths of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.